Welcome back to ECE 501B. As way of announcements, we have our final exam is the next, well, before that is your project, and I think I've made that due the Sunday evening before the week of finals. I think you're not supposed to be having things due on the week of finals. I'm hoping that that Sunday is still okay. That's, I think, the 8th of December when your project is due, and that can be team-based or individual. I've written up a short outline. I think the teams should be restricted to teams of three. So if you do do a team project, it will be a team of at most three students. If you want to do it individually, you can, but that's an individual or team-based project. Read that right up and see if it makes any sense to you, but hopefully if you've read some of those resource articles, that will give you a start up or a way into the project or an idea of what you might be doing for a project, something similar to those papers. As I said, homework eight should be forthcoming soon. That may be due in about a week is what I'm thinking, but I haven't yet decided. Wow, we have a lot of goals today, but a large piece of that is to review because it seems like it's been forever since we've seen each other, but maybe it hasn't been that long. A week ago, you were taking your exam. That's, I guess, why I feel like I haven't lectured for a while in this class. But let's remind ourselves where we are. We're in chapter 7, and we're talking about these spectral theorems. And we did it over two different vectors, inner, inner product spaces, a real and a complex. We haven't yet gotten made it to the real yet, but we did look at the complex spectral theorem. And before we present the real inner product space, spectral theorem, I want to just review the Cauchy-Schwarz inequality and completing the square. I'm assuming you're comfortable with that or you've seen that. If you haven't, it's not that big of a deal, but I just want you to see that that's where we're, what, one of the points that we're doing when we're proving lemma 711. I think last time we went to circle K, this time we're going to 711, maybe tomorrow. Never. Lemma 711, I think, is where we stopped partway through or most of the way through that proof. We'll pick up at that point. Then we'll get into the second lemma that precedes the real spectral theorem. We'll summarize these spectral theorems, which are really ways of diagonalizing or what conditions need to be true on our operators for those operators to produce a matrix representation that's diagonal. That's what these spectral theorems are really saying. When can we diagonalize an operator? In a complex inner product space and in a real inner product space. We'll try to summarize that. Then we'll look at RIP is not rest in peace, is it? This is a real inner product space. Uh, that kind of scared me. I thought maybe I was doing something deathly here, but We'll talk about two-dimensional representations of these operators on real inner product spaces, and sometimes we do not have eigenvalues in a second-order block, and that's why we're having to talk about the structure that can exist when we are working on real inner product spaces, and maybe our operator, if we were in a complex field, would allow for complex eigenvalues. But in a real inner product space, we don't have eigenvalues for certain two-dimensional subspaces. And that's what this is going to try to help us with. We'll then look at block matrix structure, because I want you to start thinking in terms of diagonal matrices. Well, if we're forced in real inner product spaces to sometimes not have eigenvalues, now we can't have a diagonal truly diagonal matrix representation, but we might have a block diagonal matrix. And those blocks might occur in one by one submatrices or two by two submatrices. And so we could have a block diagonal matrix. And then we'll talk 
if we get there, about positive operators. What does that mean? When are operators non-negative, really? And you could sort of think of the real line, the non-negative real line. We've been talking about complex numbers being analogous to linear operators. Then the adjoint operator is like what? The complex conjugate. Self-adjoint were real numbers. Then we will look at non-negative operators, which are like these numbers from zero to infinity. That's where we're headed today, hopefully. Here is just a restatement of what we've already stated and proven earlier, but I'm trying to get us thinking back in advanced linear systems theory, 501b. The complex spectral theorem says if we have a... Com complex inner product space with an operator on that space, then the space, V, has an orthonormal basis consisting of eigenvectors of the linear operator T if and only if T is normal. And that doesn't mean T is normal or abnormal. T normal just means that T, excuse me, T commutes with its adjoint. That's what we mean by normal. If T, T dagger is equal to T dagger T, then we know we can find an orthonormal basis for this vector space V, that's a complex inner product space, that has an orthonormal basis consisting of eigenvectors of T, which means T is diagonalizable if we have orthogonal eigenvectors. A, a basis of those orthogonal eigenvectors. So T is diagonalizable from that. Cauchy-Schwarz, now moving back into chapter 6, we are going to use this. This is the critical step in our proof of lemma 711. That says that the absolute value of this inner product of U with V, which could be complex, that's why we're taking the absolute value of it, that's less than or equal to the norm of u times the norm of v. But we could write that or remove that absolute value by saying, oh, we have an upper and lower bound to that inner product. And we can express that in terms of the norms of u and v. And we're going to use that lower bound in our derivation or in our proof of Lemma 711. Here is one of the notions that we will use in that proof, which is I call completing the square. We are actually going to end up with a result that looks like x squared minus alpha xy plus beta y squared. And we could end, or we could create this x squared minus alpha xy inside or as a result of squaring a set of variables. And if we squared x minus alpha over 2y, then we will, the front end of that will indeed be the x squared minus alpha xy that we want. But if we square x minus alpha over 2y, we're actually going to introduce this new piece, this alpha over 2 squared y squared, and that was nowhere to be seen in our original expression. But if we take it away, so now we're adding 0 to the formula, we're not changing that result, and we can get that first equation back if we now add in plus beta y squared, which really says that this first line, x squared minus alpha xy plus beta y squared, is equivalent to this equation in blue. x minus alpha over 2y quantity squared plus some number, beta minus alpha squared over 4 times y squared. And in this lemma, we are going to assume that this number is selected to be positive. 
we're going to want beta minus alpha squared over 4 to be bigger than 0, which means that 4 beta is bigger than alpha squared. And if that's the case, then we are assured of this blue expression being positive because we have two non-negative pieces. They can't be negative. Well, that's equivalent to this black expression, and that's what we wanted to find a bound for or to bound it away from zero. So that's why we're going to be using this result in the proof of lemma 711. Let's then return to lemma 711. Here is the lemma. It says, suppose that we have this linear operator T that is self-adjoint, which means T is equal to its adjoint. T is equal to T dagger. And let's pick alpha and beta. Here's that expression that I was referring to before, such that alpha squared is less than 4 beta. If that's the case, if we have an alpha and a beta related in this manner, then this operator, which is just a sum of three operators, T squared, alpha T, and beta I, that operator is invertible. As long as alpha squared remains less than 4 beta. That's our lemma. And we started that proof last time. And the proof, really, we just need to assume some of the given information in our lemma. Let's assume that we have an alpha beta that are real and that alpha squared is less than 4 beta. And let's just pick a vector, any vector, that's non-zero in our vector space, capital V. That's a given portion of our lemma. Then let's form this inner product. We're trying to show that that operator, t squared plus alpha t plus beta i, is invertible. Let's now form the inner product of that times a vector with the same vector. Using linearity of the first slot, we can just break that up into two, I'm sorry, into three inner products. Then the definition of the adjoint allows us to rewrite t squared v comma v inner product. We can just write t as tt, and we can slide that other front t to the second slot by using its adjoint. And we then have TV inner product with the adjoint of T times V, not doing anything different to the other two terms on the right. We assumed T was self-adjoint, so T dagger was T. That allows us to remove T dagger or replace it with T in the first inner product. And now we have a couple of norms squared, don't we? We have a vector inner product with itself in two different places, where the vector in the first inner product is TV, and the vector in the other inner in the last inner product is V. But we can now use the definition of the norm, and I think this is where we had made it to in the last lecture, maybe this definition of the norms, maybe even this lower bound. I don't remember. But what we're wanting to do now, everything up to this point was equal to that original expression of the inner product. Now what we're wanting to do is lower bound this value. which from the Cauchy-Schwarz inequality, we know that this inner product has a lower bound of minus the norms of the two vectors in those first and second slots. And if you go back to what we started with in terms of completing the square, that's what I want to do now. This first term you could think of like the x squared, 
then I have an xy and I have a y squared and I have a beta and an alpha in my completing the square idea, which if I now complete the square, I have this norm of TV minus alpha over 2 times the norm of V quantity squared. I need to get rid of that last term in the first parentheses squared, which is alpha squared over 4 or alpha over 2 quantity squared times the norm of V squared. That's where this minus is coming from, and I'm just carrying down the plus beta. And then I collect these two terms that are both containing this norm of V squared. Everything now on the right-hand side is bigger than zero. It's non-negative. So that says that whatever was on the left to begin with, which was that original inner product, that's now non-negative. And the only way for that to be non-negative is for this to be true. Maybe I should get rid of that inequality sign, since if I pick beta minus alpha squared over 4 to be strictly positive, then this is going to be strictly positive, and I can erase that, any, or that equality symbol, and now I have this inner product strictly bigger than 0, which is really what I want. Is that making sense? So I really, if I erase this and erase that, now... I know that this operator times a vector, inner product with that same vector, is not equal to zero, which means that this vector, which was arbitrary, it could have been anything, that vector is not in the null space of that operator, is it? So that vector V cannot be in the null space of t squared plus alpha t plus beta i. If it's not in the null space, any vector v is not in the null space, that means the null space is trivial for that operator. If that operator is has a trivial null space, that means that operator is injective. Question? So why did I remove that equality sign? What I'm saying now is if I assume that beta minus alpha squared over 4 is strictly greater than 0, then this first term is greater than or equal to 0. And as long as V is non-zero, then we are going to be guaranteed that we're strictly bigger than zero. Because this is a non-zero value or a, a positive number scaling a non-zero quantity. And that's added to something that's non-negative. So th that's what I'm saying allows us to say this is now greater than zero. So that now we have this result that our map is injective and what were we hoping to prove? We were hoping that that was invertible but now that we have an injective map the null space being trivial says that it is an invertible map by one of those earlier results in our book where we had this equivalence of those three different conditions, something being surjective, being injective, and being invertible. Questions on that? We now have t squared plus alpha t plus beta i is invertible. That's now a known result. 
we can now look at the next lemma that we need to in the proof of the real spectral theorem and this is now lemma 712. In this lemma we're starting with a linear operator on a vector space V and we're assuming that that operator is self-adjoint. If an operator T is self-adjoint, what do we know, know about its eigenvalues? Do you remember? So now T is equal to T dagger. And if you think about their analogous results with numbers, if T is a complex number and T dagger is its conjugate, and they're equal, if z is equal to z star, the only way that can happen is if that complex number is actually real. And so if something is self-adjoint, it has real eigenvalues. So if t is self-adjoint, then t has an eigenvalue. Since all the eigenvalues of T are real, you don't have any complex, and if you don't have any complex, then all of these potential eigenvalues are just one by one, and so now you have an eigenvalue for any operator T, as long as that operator T is self-adjoint. And I'm going to just say that the proof and we may do that a lot more. Now that we only have nine lectures, I may refer you to the book many more times so that we can get through more material. So the proof, I'm going to just say, see the textbook. But now you know that you're dealing with these one-by-ones, essentially, and if you have one-by-ones or just real eigenvalues, you have to have an eigenvalue for any size map T. Now, that allows us to get into the real spectral theorem. Which is result 713 in the textbook. And again, these spectral theorems are telling us what conditions are need to be true for these operators to be diagonalized. So for the real spectral theorem, suppose that that's what we're working on is a real inner product space. Suppose V is a real inner product space and that we have a linear operator on that real inner product space. Then V this real inner product space has an orthonormal basis consisting of the eigenvectors of this operator T if and only if this linear operator T is self-adjoint. Now the proof, now that we've done all these lemmas, we're not going to prove. <laughs> but the you would have to prove this in both directions. You assume one thing and show that it's self-adjoint, then you assume it's self-adjoint and you prove the other. In one direction, if you have an orthonormal basis of eigenvectors, what does that tell you about the matrix representation of T? It's diagonal, isn't it? So now you have a diagonal operator 
you know that it's self-adjoint if we're dealing with a real inner product space because that adjoint is can be made to be the complex conjugate transpose and the complex conjugate doesn't matter on a real inner product space. And the other one, the other direction is a little bit more involved, but you can sort of prove it by induction on looking or partitioning your vector space into different sizes of a, let's say, an orthogonal complement to the single eigenvector and go from there. So here let me just say this is to see the textbook. But what have we now learned from these two spectral theorems? Now we have a way of creating or understanding what could lead to matrices being diagonal relative to different vector spaces. One is if we have normal matrices or normal operators, then those will be diagonal representations on complex inner product space. Normal matrices have diagonal representations on complex inner product spaces. And these were all if and only if, so we could go either direction. Here I'm sort of starting with what the matrix looks like. If we have matrices associated with self-adjoint operators, so now we have self-adjoint matrices have diagonal representations on real inner product spaces. Or we could say that in the other way. So if I summarize that in the other direction, then what we've now uncovered are a couple of different relationships relative to whether this underlying vector space has an orthonormal basis. So V has orthonormal basis of eigenvectors. of this linear operator on that space if and only if if V is a complex inner product space and the linear operator T is what? Normal. So as long as T is normal on a complex inner product space, then we have this orthonormal basis. Or, if V is now a real inner product space, then in order to have an orthonormal basis of eigenvectors for that linear operator, now T needs to be self-adjoint. So now if you're given an operator T and you're working on a complex inner product space and if you can show that complex or that linear operator is normal then you know you can diagonalize that linear map. If you're working on a real inner product space and you can show that that operator is self-adjoint, 
then you know you can find a diagonalized map for that linear operator. Those are fairly specific conditions. We can actually make that a little bit more general for the real inner product space. So let's look at that. What about a more general case of V being a real inner product space and T is not self-adjoint, but what if it's normal? So what if T is normal? Meaning now we just need T times its adjoint to equal its adjoint times T. We don't need T to equal its adjoint. So this is a little more general than T being self-adjoint. And I wouldn't have asked the question if we didn't have an affirmative answer. So yes, and that's another lemma. So lemma 715 tells us something about T normal on a real inner product space. If we're given a vector space V, and actually let's restrict that to just being a two-dimensional real inner product space. And T is a linear map on that two-dimensional, so now you could just think of x, y on that real inner product space. Then we can have the following three statements being equivalent. First, If T is normal, but it's not self-adjoint, then the matrix representation of T with respect to any orthonormal basis as a particular structure and that structure is to be A minus B B A with B non-zero. The off diagonals are just negative e uh, negatives of each other which just means that we aren't saying whether one's positive or the other one's positive. We're just saying that they're the negative of each other. They're not equal to zero. So B is not equal to zero. If B was equal to zero, what would you have in this representation? You would have AA on the diagonal and only on the diagonal. And if I took the adjoint of that, what would I have? I would have AA, A, and it would be self-adjoint, and we're saying it's not self-adjoint, so we definitely need B to be not equal to zero. And we can find, for any orthonormal basis, that representation. Then we have a third equivalent statement, and that is that there is some... orthonormal basis with in that 
earlier representation with this A minus B, B, A, B in the lower left-hand corner being positive. So for any orthonormal basis, you can have these off diagonals being there and negatives of each other, but you could find a specific orthonormal basis where that lower left-hand entry is positive. Now, if you were to prove that, what's one way of proving it? When you have equivalent statements, what's the process? You could maybe just assume one, show it's equivalent to the other, and then so you could say I is equivalent, or show I implies I, I. Then you could show I, I implies I, 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 and then I, I, I implies I, and now you have it proved. And what do you think I'm going to say? That's what's done in the book. We don't have time to talk about that today. But the important thing is that this is possible when T is normal on a two-dimensional real inner product space. So now as long as this linear map is normal, you can, and that means T is, times its adjoint is equal to its adjoint times T, then you can find a representation such that, and the way I like to think of it is if you were allowed to be in a complex inner product space, these would be your real parts of your eigenvalues and these would be your imaginary parts, the B's. The A's would be your real part and the B's would be your imaginary part of your complex eigenvalues. And if you have complex eigenvalues for something like this in a two by two representation, you don't have real eigenvalues and that's why you're stuck with a two-dimensional vector space. You can't get smaller. You don't have two real eigenvalues for this particular representation. So you're stuck with, when you're dealing with real inner product spaces, you may not be able to get any smaller than a two by two. And that's what you're having to deal with in many instances if you were dealing with just real inner product spaces. Now, in order to go further with this idea, if we're now stuck with two by two matrices when we're dealing with a tenth order system, for example, on a real inner product space, then we're not going to have a diagonal that's purely a diagonal matrix. We may have pieces along the diagonal that have to be represented as two by two submatrices. And we're going to have to start dealing with block structured matrices. Meaning, if we now looked at some notation, let's say for blockwise matrix notation, what if I gave you, and here I'm simplifying it so that you can kind of see more clearly what the submatrices might be. But they don't have to all be, that lower left-hand corner is all zeros, but this upper left-hand wouldn't have to all be ones, and this upper right-hand wouldn't have to all be twos. But I'm just sort of showing you what belongs in that particular submatrix.
meaning we could write this as some A, B, 0, C, where the A is a submatrix that's 2 by 2, the B is a submatrix that's 2 by 3, and the C submatrix in this example is 3 by 3. And the entries in those submatrices don't have to be equal in order to be a submatrix. In A, we could have had 1, 10, 100, and 1,000. They could just be some generic numbers. But that structure is what I'm more interested in. The A in this block matrix structure is a 2 by 2 submatrix. And this matrix is block upper triangular, isn't it? We have a lower submatrix, zero, that's all zeros. And on our diagonal piece, we have a two by two block submatrix and a three by three block submatrix in this 5 by 5 matrix. The other thing that we will want to talk about or keep in mind before we move on to the next concept which kind of plays with these ideas of block matrix structure was back in chapter 6 If we had a linear operator on some linear vector space V, and a subspace of V, which was U, is invariant under T, then we knew something about u perp, or the orthogonal complement of u. It was invariant under t dagger. What we can actually do, now that we have this notion of normal operators, we can strengthen that or introduce even more relationships that are true besides just t being or u being invariant under t and u pert being invariant under t dagger. So let's now see what we can do when we have normal operators. And this is now Proposition 18 in Chapter 7. Suppose we do have a linear operator T, and obviously it's normal. And now let's also assume that U is a subspace of V and that subspace U is invariant under that operator, linear operator T.
if that's the case, then we can show that a lot of different conditions are fall out or result. First is that the orthogonal complement to that subspace U is also invariant under the original operator T. So now it's not just the adjoint of T. B is that the original subspace U is invariant under T dagger. So anything in U, if we operate on it by the adjoint operator, it will stay in U. Likewise for U perp. Anything in U perp stays in U perp when we operate on it with T. So now we've decomposed our space, really, based on this one subspace U. Because if we have this decomposition of something in U and U perp and operate on it with T, then those two pieces stay separate based on these conditions, and the conditions were that T was normal. So being normal, being a normal operator is pretty powerful in terms of working on these vector spaces V. The other, there's five of these, we can also say that the linear operator T restricted to U, that adjoint is equal to the adjoint restricted to U. Well, that's like chasing your tail if you had a tail. Maybe you can watch an animal chase its tail, but that's kind of what that's doing there. We also know that T restricted to U as an operator is also normal on the subspace U. What's normal again? The operator times its adjoint is equal to the adjoint times the operator. And we have the last one, which says that T restricted to the orthogonal complement of U is normal on U perp. Let's show a few of these are equivalent. Maybe we won't show all of those, but let's now look at a couple of those at least. So now let's first let's pick some ortho orthonormal basis for U, this subspace U. So now let E one, E2, up to E sub M, Michigan. <coughs> Not being very clean with my subscripts. Let's let that be an orthonormal basis of this subspace U. And we know that we can extend an orthonormal. U is a subspace, and we have all of V. Let's now extend a set of basis vectors to cover all of V. So now we have an orthonormal basis of U and extend to, let's say we had E's. Let's now go up with F's. for all of V. So an extend to E1 through EM, F1 up to FM for an orthonormal normal 
basis on V. And now what if we looked at the original hypothesis U is an in, is a subspace of V and it's invariant under T. So now let's use that result. Since U is invariant under T, if we have T e to the J, what do we know about that as a vector? That's going to just be a vector, isn't it? But if we now operate on any of those basis vectors, e to the j, and u is made up of those e's, e1 through e sub m, then t e sub j is going to be a linear combination of all of those e's, right? No f's. So now T e sub j is expressible in those e sub 1 through e sub m's. So let's say that we don't yet know what the matrix representation of T looks like, but let's just assume that we now have, in terms of dimensions, a matrix that's compatible. Let's say this is E1 up to E sub M. And this is now F1, F sub N. Now, if we pick any T E sub J, that's going to be some A1 J E1 plus A2 J E2, et cetera, isn't it? Plus all the way up to E sub M J E to the N. Because U was invariant under T. Question. So now what we have said is we said that A was invariant. I'm sorry, T, I'm getting my A, that's the matrix representation of T. T was invariant, or this subspace U was invariant under T. So if we hit anything in U with T, we're going to remain in U. So now if we simply say here is a representation of if this is my matrix representation for T, and now if I know I have Michigan of these orthonormal vectors, E1 through E sub M, that are invariant when they're hit with T, then I have to stay in this sort of block structure. Meaning if I pick an E1 through EM, I need to stay only with a vector that contains E1 through EMs. I can't be combining any of the Fs. So if you think of a sort of your vectors made up of E1 through EM, F1 through FM, then if anything starting that's made up of just the E's can't have any F's. We assume that. So by assumption, this matrix AB0C is the assumption that we start with. So now what we're wanting to do is we're trying to see what does, is B going to be non-zero or do, 
can we say anything more about the structure? So the question I think was, do we know anything more? At this point, no. So right now, this is all the structure that we can assume on our matrix representation of T based on our beginning hypothesis that U, which we then assumed had these basis, orthonormal basis vectors E1 through EM, is invariant under T. Then we say, okay, let's find a matrix, let's just pick a matrix representation for T, and we know it has to be at least that hard zero in the lower left. What's left, we don't quite know, but we know we have an A, maybe a B, maybe a C, but we know we have that hard zero down there in the lower left because U is invariant under T. So that structure is all we know right now, but let's now see if we can impose more structure on that matrix representation. Does that help? Meaning if U is invariant under T, then these little A's are living here in that A matrix. They're linearly combining E1 through E sub n. And we can't have any F's appearing in this representation of T E sub j because anything on E sub j is going, or that the linear operator works on has to live in U because it's invariant under T. Now, if we have this representation for T E sub j, what do we know about the square of the norm of T E sub j? Can we rewrite that? And what did we also assume? Where did we make that assumption? Right here, we're assuming that those E1 through E sub M are an orthonormal basis. If they are an orthonormal basis, what do we know about the inner product of E1 with E2? It's zero. E1 with E1, inner product, one. Because of that orthonormal structure of the basis, now we know how to rewrite the norm squared of T E sub J if it's made up of this linear combination of the E1 through E M's. It's simply going to be those coefficients of A's squared added up. So this is now a1j squared plus a sub 2j squared plus dot 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 plus a sub mj squared. Or that's just the sum of a sub ij squared i equal 1 to m. Now, what do we know about the adjoints? Oh, well, let me do this, I guess, for all of the different pieces. So that's true for any E sub J scaled by T. We can do that for all the E sub J's, can't we? So now we could say that now if we took the sum from j equal 1 to m of the left-hand sides, these t e to the j squareds, then that's going to introduce a double sum on the right. That's now a sum from j equal 1 to m, sum from j equal 1 to m of a sub i j squared. if we simply summed all of those norm squares of T E sub J's. 
We have m of those, potentially. So this is the sum of the square of the absolute values of all of the elements in A in that block submatrix of A. Is that okay? So now we have that result. But from our study of adjoints, what do we know about the relationship between rows and columns of the operator and the adjoint? So from the study of adjoints, we saw that rows of the matrix representation of T are also these adjoints of T sub J, meaning if we looked at T dagger of E sub J, that's now E sub, let's say, 1J E1 plus A 2J E2 plus dot 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 plus A sub M E M. But now this is going down the columns, and now we have that B matrix that we have to worry about, plus B, let's say, 1J F1 plus B sub N J F N. Meaning the adjoint operating on any of these E sub J's, because of this transpose relationship on the operator and its adjoint, now this is going to be something that occurs in sort of the transpose of this matrix operation. So that now if we transpose this matrix, now we have A and B that are going to linearly combine the E's and F's to form some T dagger E sub J. So if we had T dagger E sub J, that's going to be some column here, which is actually a row up here. And that's now going to be a, a combination of the A's and some B's that pull off or weight the E1's through EM's and the F1's through FN's. So now we have this big mess. But if we now look at the norm squared of the left-hand side, E's and F's were both orthonormal basis vectors, and F's were extensions of E's. So now this is just these A1J squared plus A2J squared, et cetera, plus A sub MJ squared plus B sub 1J squared, B sub 2J squared, etc., B sub NJ squared. And I could rewrite that as this sum from, let's say, I equal 1 to M of A sub 1J squared plus this sum from, let's say, L equal 1 to N of B sub LJ squared.
And if we wanted to, we could sum all of those up. If we needed to, if we wanted to try to form all of these combinations, we have J of those. We have one, I'm sorry, we have M of those of these J's. We have 1, 2, up to M, and so we could sum all of those again. So now if we sum those like we had done before, then we could sum over all of these J's from J equal 1 to M of T e to the J, and that's dagger squared, but that's now the sum of all of that right-hand side, isn't it? which is all the A's and the B's summed up, squared. But what did we assume way back here in the beginning? we assume T was normal. And if T is normal, we have a result with respect to their norms, don't we, and their adjoints. So now, but with T being normal, Then we know that T e to the J is equal to T dagger e to the J. For all J. That's if T is normal. We know their norms are preserved between the operator and its adjoint. That means that if we looked at summing all of those, we would have this sum from j equal 1 to m of t e to the j squared. That's equal to the sum from j equal 1 to m of t dagger e to the j squared. You see what I've now just done? Maybe. I can now claim that the sum of all of these t e to the j squareds must equal the sum of the t daggered e to the j squareds. And what did we have for all of that mess? Well, here, in the last one with the T dagger, we had not only this double sum on the A sub I J's, but we had a double sum on the B sub L J's. On the first, so that's the right hand side. But then on the left hand side, we just have this double sum of the A's. So I have the double sum of the A's equal the double sum of the A's plus the double sum of the B's. If they're equal, then what do we know about the B's? They can sting, can't they? So B's we want to get rid of. We set them equal to zero so they don't sting us, right? So if the B's are all zero, which is what we've just shown because T was normal, now we've shown that even though we assumed a unknown B in that original structure of AB0C, now we've just concluded that B must have been zero based on T being normal. We assumed the lower left was zero because U was invariant under T. Now because T was also normal, we've shown that B is zero. Now we have a block diagonal structure in our T, in the matrix representation of T. And if we have a block triangle or a block diagonal, well, let me just conclude this for now. So now, because it's normal, we have this relationship 
which says that the sum of all of these elements squared in the B block, in block B, must be zero. then all of the elements of B are zero, and now we can say that the block structure of our matrix representation of T is even more specific. We now have A, zero, but now we have zero C. So that now we have these E1s this is now E sub M columns. It's E sub or M rows. But the upper right hand block is now forced to be zero, and the lower left hand block is forced to be zero. What does this imply about something living in F? or made up of linear combinations of these orthonormal basis vectors f, f1 through fn. Now those are invariant, aren't they? If we start in f, we end in f. If we operate on it by t, based on now this new structure that we've now verified is true. So this implies that T of any of these F's, F sub K, is going to stay in the F's, the span of F1, F2, F sub N. That's true for all the K, but what did we assume for the F's? That was a basis of U perp, wasn't it? F1, F2, since it was orthonormal to the E's, which were basis for U's, then they must be the span of U perp. But F1, F2 through Fm is, in, is a basis of U perp, which now says that U perp is invariant under this linear operator T. So we started with T being normal and U being a subspace that was invariant to T. So if we started in U, we stayed in U if we operated on that vectors in U with T. But if that's the case, then anything in U perp, any orthogonal complement, if we operate in on anything in that with T, we stay in U perp. And that was the first condition, the one of five, right? So now A is proven based on the original assumption in our proposition. Do we have time to prove B? What was B? <laughs> U is invariant under the adjoint of T. And what do we know about the adjoint of T? It's the complex conjugate transpose of T if we're in the right basis, right? We have to have an orthonormal basis, and we do now with these E's. If I keep stalling, we won't have time, will we? Now B. 
So in the matrix representation of T dagger is the conjugate transpose of the matrix representation of T. So the matrix representation of T dagger, what do we know it looks like? It enjoys the same block diagonal structure, doesn't it? Here's E1 through EM, here's F1 through Fn, since it's the complex conjugate transpose. E1 through EM, F1 through Fn. What does this show about something that starts in E? T dagger E to the J. What's that live in? That stays in the upper left, doesn't it? Or in the same span, E1 through E sub M for all J, which says that U is invariant under T dagger. So I thank you for your patience on that, giving me an extra minute to get through B. Now you can do C, D, and E in the textbook, right? So we will start with something new beyond this. We won't continue with this proof on Monday.